coming to you from historic Redeemer Lutheran Church in Elmhurst, Illinois. All the devil 
devil has to do is get us to question God's word. Did God really say? Did God really say that there are limits to what is acceptable in our private lives? Did God really say that sex is something given only to husbands and wives? Did God really say that we should take care of others, love others, as we take care of and love ourselves? Did God really say that coveting, simply wanting what someone else has, is a sin? Did God really say that murder, the intentional ending of life, even for the weak, the inconvenient, the suffering, is wrong? Did God really say that we are to do good to those who do evil to us and pray for those who persecute us? Did God really say? And we fall for it, even today, by the millions, by the billions. Repent. Like our ancestors, we all hear those seductive questions that lead us away from the Lord's word and into the fallen desires of our flesh. The devil's tactics have worked so well for thousands of years that it's no surprise that he thought that he might be able to take on Jesus. After all, Jesus was alone in the wilderness. He was hungry after fasting for 40 days. Jesus was lacking all of the advantages that Adam and Eve had, all the benefits that the Israelites had in the Promised Land, all the luxuries and amenities that we've been given. It would appear that Jesus was an easy target. And so the devil tried to get Jesus to question the very last words that the Father had spoken to him at his baptism. You are my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. Now in order to get Jesus to doubt these words, the devil tried a two-pronged approach. To doubt God's word and to appeal to his son. It had worked well with Eve in the Garden of Eden, after all, who saw that the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was both good for food and desirable to make one wise. And so the devil tried to get Jesus to doubt the Father's words. If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. If you were really the Son of God, why would you be hungry? Why would your father let your stomach growl? If you're really God's son, why would he want you to be in this state? Prove that you're his son. Make these stones into bread. What's happening in the temptation of our Lord is, for lack of a better word, a rematch. In their crushing loss to the devil, mankind handed over creation to subject it to the power of sin and death. And this is why the tempter offers all the kingdoms of the earth to Jesus in the second temptation, saying, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. This is a rematch between the devil and Adam. But this time, it's a greater Adam who's up against the tempter. It's nothing new. It's the same old scene. The devil trying to get someone to doubt God's word, appealing both to flesh and spirit, stomach and reason. Only this time, the result is different. Only this time, Jesus steps into the place of all mankind and fights for us. He does what we could not, what we would not, what we most often don't even want to do. He doesn't put his stomach first. He doesn't turn the stone to bread. He doesn't listen to the devil's half-truths. He fights on our behalf, showing the devil that his victories are at an end. Jesus gets the victory over the devil that we cannot accomplish on our own. And this means that we're free. 
The devil has no more power over us. He's chained up, beaten, vanquished. We're not facing an undefeated champion anymore. He was handed his first loss in the wilderness by Jesus, and nothing has been the same ever since. His power is broken. We can see his temptations for what they are. Lies about who God is. Lies about who we are. Lies about our relationships. Lies about what God has said. He's like a rabid dog that's been firmly tied up. He might bark and growl and lunge, but he's limited. He's restrained by Jesus' victory. Seeing those lies for what they are, and recognizing that the devil has been defeated by Jesus, gives us strength and nerve to stand up to temptation. This means that we don't have to be slaves to our flesh. We don't have to doubt God's word. And sometimes, by the grace of God, we do stand up to temptation. Sometimes we do resist. That's good. Give thanks to God for times like that. When you silence your selfishness. When you do what God has commanded rather than what you want to do. When you get yourself to church to hear his word, even when you're exhausted or have a full day ahead of you, give thanks for those times that you turn away from the images that you know you shouldn't be looking at, or walk away from the gossip session that all of your friends are engaged in. Give thanks for times like that. These moments are given to you because your Lord has overcome the tempter, and by his grace, he shares that victory with you. Does that mean that it will always be easy? No. The devil might be a rabid dog that's chained up, but there are times that we'll walk right up to him and stand in striking distance. The struggle between our fallen flesh and the resurrected saint within us won't end until we rest in the Lord's presence. The war will always go on. St. Paul puts it this way. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. It's difficult. It's a struggle. Our flesh must be tamed. Our will to sin and get what we want, when we want it, must be restrained. And that's hard. But no one ever said the Christian life <coughs> is easy. And that's why St. Paul continues, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Christ Jesus our Lord. Fighting temptation is hard but we're not alone. We don't lean on our own strength or willpower. Jesus has conquered in the fight, and he provides us strength. He doesn't offer us stones to eat to strengthen us. In fact, he gives us so much more than even miraculous bread made from stones. He knows that we don't live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. And so he offers himself to us to sustain us and nourish us. Himself, the word made flesh, proceeding from the mouth of the Lord, given to our mouths. He gives us his own body and blood, the very body and blood that defeated the devil, and he gives this to us to strengthen us in this wilderness, in our fight against temptation. And so we put on the whole armor of God. That is, we put on Christ by hearing his word, so that we may be able to stand up against the schemes of the devil. And when we fail, which will happen, when we do give in, when we do doubt God's word, when the sinner in each of us gets the upper hand, 
It's that same body and blood. It's that same word of forgiveness that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord that washes away our failures and covers us up with Jesus' own victory over temptation and the devil. Jesus' victory is eternal. He won it in the wilderness. He won it on the cross. He won it with the empty tomb. And it's always shared with us. When we fail on our own, that's when we have to turn our eyes back to the victory of Jesus. The cross of Jesus. Not only during this season of Lent, but always being drawn back into his never-failing and never-changing word of truth. The world might not know who will win the fight between good and evil, but we do. Jesus has already defeated the tempter, and so we run to the places where his victory is given to us. In his holy, precious word, proclaimed here among his people, in the pure water of the baptismal font, which turns our desert wilderness into a new and better garden. In the Holy Supper, where body and bread, wine and blood, are laid out before us in the presence of our defeated enemies. Jesus has won, and that steals us for the fight. In the name of our conquering Savior, Amen.